Good evening, good morning, wherever you're coming from. Um, we are so happy to have all of you here. Um, this is an initiative that a few of us between um, Democrats for Israel, between Progressive Zionists of California, um, and some just activists in the party have been very passionate about, which is educating and speaking a little bit about anti-Semitism, um, especially with the way the world is right now, especially with um, the California Democratic Party's convention coming up. We thought that this was an important issue and we wanted to bring together the Jewish community um, to really be able to talk a little bit about it and how we can find ways to build coalitions <laughs> with others um, and fight it together. And so I, to introduce myself, my name is Victoria Salkovitz. I'm a proud DFI Los Angeles board member and also an elected party delegate from AD45. So welcome assembly member Gabriel. It's a great to have you here. Um, we want to open up the evening actually by welcoming our amazing representatives from the California Legislative Jewish Caucus to say a few words. So assembly member Gabriel, if you would like to go first as the chair, that would be amazing. Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. It's so good to see you. And uh, I, we, we, we are so proud to have you as an elected delegate from 8045 and so grateful for all of the work that you've done. And I just have an embarrassment of riches in my district for the leadership on this. Uh, Kiyomi Kowalski, who's an incredible activist and uh, Greg Solkovich, I think it's a little bit of credit for, uh, for all of the good work and to see so many good activists uh, around the state like Susan George and, and everyone else. I just wanted to be on very quickly um, on behalf of myself and my partner Scott in, from the California Legislative Jewish Caucus to just say how grateful we are for all of the work that you're doing. We know that these are such uh, complicated and difficult issues. Um, you're really jumping into the heart of things and we are just, every member of the caucus, all 18 of us, really appreciates the work that all of you are doing. We talk about it and, and, and we are really grateful. We know that sometimes that means com complicated and uncomfortable conversations, um, but, but, but they mean a lot and they mean a lot to our community and we're really grateful for the work that you're doing. And we want, we want to support you however we can. I mean, we're very fortunate, our Jewish caucus here in Sacramento and the legislature has developed some really powerful partnerships with the Black Caucus, with the Latino Caucus, with the API Caucus, with the LGBTQ Caucus, with the Women's Caucus. We work really closely with them. We support their priorities. They have been really strong allies and partners of ours. And we have work to do to make that the case within the party. Um, and it's hard work and it's complicated work and it involves complicated conversations. But I just, I, I cannot emphasize enough um, how grateful we are uh, for people like you, Victoria, and you, Kiyomi, who are willing to dive in head first, have difficult conversations, bring people together. This is, this is the essential work for our community. Um, and you guys are just total rock stars. And I can't tell you how many times I've looked in the email and said, thank God for Susan George, or thank God for Greg Solkovitz. So um, I just want you to know you have the full support of the caucus behind you. Um, whatever we can do to help you, you know, we're, we're a little distracted right now because it's a busy time in Sacramento with the bills, but we got your back. Um, we're here for you. We're, we're really excited to deepen the partnership. And, and of course, thank you to ADL and AJC and all the incredible community organizations that, um, that are doing this work. So we just, we're, we're so grateful and we're so appreciative. And I, I am personally very appreciative for, for Scott's great leadership. He is uh, single-handedly destroying stereotypes about the height of Jewish men um, and, uh, and doing a lot of, and doing a lot of really good, doing a lot of really good work on a lot of, uh, a lot of progressive issues. And it's been a great, a great advocate for our Jewish community. So thanks for having me. Um, we can't wait to see you all in person. Uh, and we're really looking forward to growing our partnership with all of you. Great. Thank you. Assembly member Gabriel, we are so lucky to have you. Um, Senator Weiner, we would love to, to have you speak as well. Great. Uh, thank you. And, and assembly member, I'm, I've been I'm shrinking. I uh, got measured recently and I, I lost a little bit. So, you know, we all peak and then we go down. So, but I'm still, I'm still fairly tall. Um, thank you for having me tonight. Sorry for the super spooky lighting. I'm like totally backlit or something, but um, you get the gist. Um, and I, I just want to say, uh, I, I'm really excited about our legislative Jewish caucus and uh, assembly member Gabriel is just really rocking it as chair of that caucus. Uh, and we have, you know, it's a new caucus. We've only been around for about six years. Uh, and every year it gets stronger and stronger um, and, and broader in our engagement. So I'm really excited 
about where we are and we have really great uh, collaboration going on. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you to all of you for organizing this. This is really about just making sure that we um, as Jews and as supporters of the state of Israel um, are able to get accurate uh, information out and, and are able to make clear that it, that, that it's, you know, while it's always appropriate to criticize Israel or any other country, um, there are times when it can tip uh, into anti-Semitism. And, you know, I'm, a, a, I'm not a particular fan, I'll be honest, of the current government of Israel or of the settlement policy, but I love the state of Israel and, and embrace it with all my heart because I know that, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that my um, you know, great grandparents fled Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. Had they not done that, I almost certain I wouldn't be here today because they would have almost certainly not made it through the Holocaust. And having that one place on Earth uh, where we can go, um, that you know, because even though people say, "Well, it's fine today," well, they thought it was fine in Germany in the 1920s, and Jews were in very high, prominent positions. And it still happened. And so the, the existence of the state of Israel just matters so deeply. Uh, and we need to be working towards a two-state solution and, and to peace and a secure and, vi uh, and a secure and viable Israel and a secure and viable Palestine. Uh, and, and that needs to be a shared uh, goal. And again, it's fine for people to criticize the government of Israel or any government. Um, but it just sometimes goes uh, too far, too far, and um, and it is a uh, um, sadly it, you know that these problems arise in different parts of the political spectrum in different ways, but it has a common denominator, uh, and so we as Jews, we as progressives, um, uh, you know, I think we have a real obligation to provide accurate information and to you know call it out. When 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 some of the sentiment sentiment tips into stereotypes um, about uh, our community, uh, and so um, so again, thank you for what you do, and I look forward to continuing uh, to work together uh, as elected officials, um, as as grassroots activists, as Jewish community leaders, uh, to move us in a strong direction. So thank you. Thank you, Senator, and I think I'm speaking on behalf of everyone that we are just so grateful for how much um, support throughout the Jewish community that we have for this event, um, whether it's our co-sponsors really representing across the board the Jewish community of California, and that's a, a very big deal um, because it really shows that we are united in talking about anti-Semitism and working to really uh, cross some barriers. So thank you both for being here. Just to give everybody a little bit of an overview of what tonight will look like, um, we are going to spend a little bit of time with each of our panelists today. So I'm going to let my co-moderators introduce yes. them. But yeah, no problem. Just want to let you know Senator, someone doesn't mind. <laughs> Beautiful. Great. Okay, classic. Um, so, anyways. Each of our panelists is going to get a little segment to speak on their particular um, expertise with a little bit of a back and forth with my co-moderators. If throughout these segments, you, um, the participants are having any questions come up, feel free to send them down below on the chat. I'm keeping track of it. Also on Facebook Live, feel free to send them there and I'll be watching them there as well. And later after all our panelists make their initial have their initial conversation, we will do a back and forth um, together going through those questions. Um, and that's about it. I'm really, really excited to introduce our co-host, the Executive Director of Progressive Zionists of California, Susan George. Um, Susan, if you would like to take it away, um, go for it. Thank you so much, Victoria. It's great to be here. Um, I do not represent AD45. I'm actually from AD14, and I'm, a, I'm a, an ADEM delegate from AD14 representing the, uh, the Bay Area. So it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to be introducing Holly Huffnagel, who is here from AJC. Holly serves as AJC's US Director for Combating Anti-Semitism. 
spearheading the agency's response to anti-Semitism in the United States and its efforts to better protect the Jewish community. We're delighted that you're here, Holly, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm delighted to be here as well. I'm calling in from Washington, DC, but I was born in Thousand Oaks, grew up in Ventura County, went to school in Santa Barbara. So California is very near and dear to, to my heart. I'm gonna jump actually right into my presentation. I don't know, I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, and that really is on the current state of anti-Semitism in America. What are we seeing right now? And so I'm going to share my screen. One second. All right. I want to actually start with the FBI hate crime statistics report. Just really right up front, what are we seeing? This came out in 2020. It's for 2019, though. We know that 60.2% of all religious bias crimes in America today target Jews. And American Jews make up less than 2% of the population, but receive the majority of religious bias crimes. This number is actually up from 56.9% um, in 2018. And, and 2018 included the Pittsburgh um, Tree of Life synagogue, synagogue shooting. But specifically, let's look at the state of California. California has experienced a 72% increase in anti-Semitism over the last three years. Uh, Jews are the state's primary religious hate crime target and the third most frequently targeted ethnic group. Um, Anti-Jewish hate crimes specifically in 2019 has increased 12%. A key piece here though, is that only 195 California law enforcement agencies, and this is of 737 which participate um, in the FBI's program to report hate crime in the state of California, submitted, incidents, uh, submitted incident reports to the FBI. So we know that the data we have is probably not a full picture of what is actually going on. And we do know that anti-Semitic um, you know, crimes and, and incidents are actually underreported. We know that from the Jewish community themselves. We know 76% of American Jews in the last five years have, that have experienced anti-Semitism actually did not report it to law enforcement. So the question is anti-Semitism a problem in America today? AJC, American Jewish Committee, we conducted a survey uh, in, in, uh, in the fall of 2020, and this was some of the results that we found. Nine in 10 American Jews, 88% say yes, it is a problem. The big finding though, I think from this, from this question for, for us is one in three, at this number at the bottom, one in three US adults, because we also separately surveyed Amer you know, non-Jewish Americans on what they, same questions. We asked the same questions to American Jews, same questions to, to the general population. One in three do not think it's a problem, as a, as a US adult do not think it's a problem. So there's just divergence if, if it's uh, a problem in the US. This was also another divergence we found. We found that the amount of anti-Semitism in America over the past five years um, when asked to the American Jewish community, eight in 10, 82% says, yes, it's increased. You know, we've seen it. We, we, see, we saw Pittsburgh, we saw Poway, we saw Jersey City and, and Muncie, New York, and the continuous attacks against Jews in Brooklyn. Yes, it's increased. However, half that number, 43% of, of, of Americans, of, of the general public, believe that it's increased. In fact, uh, this, this point isn't on this slide, but 53% of US adults believe that anti-Semitism has either stayed the same or has decreased in the last five years, which is, is the opposite of what the data, the data is telling us. This is also a really important piece to the equation because when we talk about rising anti-Semitism and when we list anti-Semitism you know, with other forms of hatred and bigotry, we found that almost half of the general public actually isn't familiar with the term anti-Semitism. 21% have never heard that word before and 25% have heard of it, but they aren't really sure what it means. So this is a really big starting point. We have to be able to explain what it is, what it looks like today. And, and you know, when we did this survey, we did tell them, you know, our, 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 our survey participants, what anti-Semitism was. We mentioned it as, as a hostility towards Jews, um, you know, a certain perception of Jews. And then they continue to answer those questions. This was actually the very first question that we asked them. Um, but this really is our, our, our starting point uh, when we are explaining what's, what's happening. 
Continuing to how American Jews are experiencing anti-Semitism in America today, 37%, so more than one in three, 37% have actually been targets of anti-Semitism both online and offline in the past five years. Um, most of these attacks are actually online. This is 22% were online attacks and 3% um, were physical attacks. So I, it is important to differentiate physical attacks from you know, either verbal attacks or other forms of harassment. But one, more than one in three American Jews have experienced anti-Semitism. We also asked about sources. I think today it's so important we understand that anti-Semitism is not only coming from the far right white supremacist, you know, you know, xenophobic traditional sources that are really easy for us to call out and easy for us to identify. Now in the United States, that still poses the biggest threat. We know that the majority of incidents still come from the far right and the American Jewish community recognizes that. 89% said that it was the far right poses um, a threat, and actually 49% of American Jews said it, it, the far right poses a very serious uh, threat in America. Um, but there's also other sources as well. So, you know, we uh, when I think about a global threat, um, extremism in the name of Islam, this is actually one of the, the, the biggest sources of attacking Jews in Western Europe um, in the last uh, decade. 85% of American Jews see this source as a threat, um, with 27% saying it's a very serious threat. In this case, I'd actually probably broaden this category, talk about a, a source of religious extremism in general. That, that puts Jersey City actually into that category. A Jersey City um, shooting in 2019 in December um, was done by uh, members of a Black Hebrew Israelite group. Uh, they were self-proclaimed black supremacists, uh, saying that Jews aren't real Jews, and um, that was the result of, of, of that anti-Semitic attack. And then finally, uh, another source of anti-Semitism is, is from the far left, and I think this is kind of what we're, we're grappling with right now in, in, the, in progressive spaces. 61% of American Jews believe that the extreme political left does pose a threat. Um, however, only 16% see it as a very serious threat. So we can juxtapose that 16% of severity with that 49% of seeing the far right as, as, as a severe threat. But this is a space that you know, we, we see, especially on, on, on campus. Um, we see it with conspiracy theories um, about Jewish power, control, or privilege, um, anti-Israel, anti-Semitism. Again, this is all captured in, in this extreme political left space. One in four American Jews have avoided publicly wearing, carrying, or displaying things that might help people identify them as Jews over the past two years. Um, this was a big finding really since the Tree of Life synagogue shooting. 25% um, of American Jews have at least at some point um, not wanted to be identified as, 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 as being Jewish or having people identify them as, as Jewish. And then in answer to the question, and this is interesting because we actually have some trend data here so we can actually compare it uh, between 2019 and 2020. Do you ever avoid certain places, events, or situations out of concern for your safety as someone who's Jewish? And in 2019, one in four American Jews said, yes, I, I have. And in 2020, that number actually jumped to, to almost one in three, 31%. And you know, this is really telling for us. It really sets the stage of, of what American Jews are feeling. And we do know that those feelings align with, with the data from, from the FBI. And when, when AJC actually, American Jewish Committee, conducted this, this survey with all of these questions about, you know, do you think it's a problem? Has it increased? Have you experienced it? Where have you experienced it? And we, there was many, many other questions to this survey. This is just a, a small taste. We modeled this survey after a survey that had been done in Europe, first in 2012 and again in 2018. And anti-Semitism in Europe actually hit an up, like an uptick, a spike to about a decade before it has here in the United States. And so the Europeans actually are a little ahead of us in, in, in pushing back against rising anti-Semitism. And so we modeled our survey after their questions. And I think there we were surprised actually to find some answers that were similar to how European Jews were answering, were answering those questions. And it's actually on, on this note that I wanna share with you a story. And, and because in many ways, some European governments are fighting anti-Semitism and figuring out how to push back against its different forms, you know, even a decade before we are, there are tools that have been developed and being used in Europe that I think we're, are going to be very applicable here to what we're dealing with in, in the United States. It's not, it's not exact. It's, of course, there's different contexts, different situations. American, American Jewish history is very different than European Jewish history. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's a much incredibly better place, I think, to be a, to be a Jew historically in, in the United States. But 
there are tools that we can can and and should borrow from from Europe. So remember this picture. This is a synagogue in Wuppertal, Germany, in, in July 2014. Um, and just keep that in your mind. And I'm actually going to stop stop sharing my screen and um, share a little story to to conclude. So one second, let me make sure I'm really. So if you think of that synagogue in, in your mind, Verpetal Synagogue was actually, that's not the original synagogue. The original synagogue was burned in, in 1938 by, by the Nazis um, during, during Kristallnacht. And after the Holocaust, Verpetal's surviving Jewish community had only 60 members. There was no synagogue. Um, it really seemed destined for extinction. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, the German government actually opened the country up to persecuted um, Soviet Jews. And soon Jewish refugees from Uzbekistan, Belarus, Ukraine, Russia were, were coming into Germany. And the population, the Jewish population in this town of Berpetal, Germany, reached 2,500. And in 2002, a, a new synagogue, the, the Burgish Synagogue, which was the synagogue you saw, was inaugurated. And things were looking really good for the Jewish community. Um, fast forward to 2014. That synagogue was getting a lot of attention. It was the wake of the Gaza war. And on July 25th, 2014, someone spray painted free Palestine on the front wall of the building. But the, the real shock came in, in the early morning of, of July 29th, 2014. The news spread quickly through the, the Jewish community of this town that someone had actually tried to firebomb the synagogue. So, so what happened? Following the end of, of a Ramadan celebration the night before, uh, three Palestinian German protesters actually threw um, Molotov cocktails at the synagogue. And thankfully the devices failed to ignite. Now the police caught and arrested the three men. The court sentenced them. They were sentenced for arson and actually for causing almost a thousand euros worth of damage um, with a threat of jail, like if they got into trouble again. But the attack was called an act of protest it was not called anti-Semitism, which actually, you know, which bears a much higher penalty in Germany, which makes sense given the, the history of anti-Semitism in Germany. But here we have a synagogue, a Jewish house of worship, firebombed in response to the policies of Israel, a nation state, and it's not being called anti-Semitism. And the decision, the decision was appealed, no luck. It was appealed again, still the, the original lower court decision held. And I had the opportunity actually to go to Berlin. Um, but prior to coming to AJC, I worked under the second Obama administration at the US Department of State um, under Secretary uh, uh, of State Kerry. And we went, to, I worked in an office that dealt with anti-Semitism issues. We went to Berlin and we met with a German lawyer whose lawsuits typically relate to Jewish issues and anti-Semitism charges to discuss what happened. And he said that the problem in Germany is that we don't have a definition of what is anti-Semitism. Because the courts, and because the courts don't have a definition, the decisions and the verdicts, they vary. And while anti-Semitism is illegal in Germany, anti-Israelism and, and anti-Zionism, um, you know, simply defined as, you know, believing that the Jewish state she does not have a right to exist, um, are, are legal. So what was actually happening was um, instead of explicitly anti-Semitic utterances or anti-Semitic acts, there were these new indirect ways of verbalizing and, dis and disseminating Judeophobic ways of thinking. And government leaders, police, scholars, they noticed that both the far right and the far left were actually using anti-Israel language to express anti-Semitic stereotypes and tropes in order for it not to be illegal or for them not to be caught. And the Verpital example is really one of many, many examples of a long trend that really started in the early 2000s, especially in Europe, of where Jews were being attacked or targeted as, as agents of Israel or blamed for Israeli actions. Um, even like attacking school children in Toulouse, with killing school children in Toulouse was reportedly protesting the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so, you know, given this resurgence, that was really when policymakers, organizations, government leaders came together to address this, this new concern. And in 2004, they, this, you know, they, there was a decision amongst many different actors that there needed to be some kind of definition, a working definition that would capture what was happening, that would be able to have examples of instances where something could be anti-Semitic for, for, for law enforcement, for practitioners, for data monitors. And what you have in 2004, 2005 is the beginning of something that would become um, an educational resource that we now know as the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Working Definition of, of Anti-Semitism. 
And that is something that is being used across Europe today um, to fight this very issue I mentioned. And you know, I do believe, and, and, and American Jewish Committee and other Jewish organizations as well, see this as an educational resource that can have utility here in the US um, as we're facing our own uptick um, in anti-Semitism. And especially when we know that almost half of the American public really isn't familiar what that term is, what the term means, and what anti-Semitism looks like uh, today. So Susan, I'll, I'll end there. Um, I think I went a minute and a half over my 13 minutes, but we can uh, discuss more about the definition uh, shortly. Thank you for all that background. It's very helpful. I had no idea of those, the beginnings of what, where people saw the need to have a working definition of anti-Semitism. Um, I'd like to drill down a bit on the IRA. Um, yeah. there's, there's a lot of criticism about it, primarily in progressive spaces, that it curtails free speech and silences any criticism of Israel. And I'd like you to comment on that. Of course, uh, you know, it's it's coming from the, the government where we were at the State Department under the Obama administration, we sent a delegation to the IRA and we were in Bucharest in 2016. And I've, you know, it's, 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 I'm almost surprised to see how it's not being taken as, as easily or as, as, as seen as useful here in, in the United States. So I'm happy to, to, to answer any, anyone's questions uh, about it, but specifically your questions about free speech and, and silence and criticism of Israel. I think first, just for starters, everyone needs to read the definition. I can't, you'd be amazed how many people have never read it. They're very critical of it, but they actually haven't read the, it's a very short document. Um, and it really is not the definition itself. It's the examples that kind of pose the, 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 the biggest concern. So your question is kind of two parts. The first is, does it limit or curtail free speech? I think this critique actually misrepresents the, the working definitions purpose, like its original purpose. So. It was meant to be this kind of flexible educational tool to, to help people recognize anti-Semitism, not, not to sanction speech. And I think, you know, in the United States, even more so than in Europe, where there, there are hate speech codes, we don't have that here in the United States because the First Amendment protects all speech. It protects racist speech. It protects homophobic speech. It protects, it protects anti-Semitic speech. But I think where such intolerance can have consequences, even if it's a determining motivation of hate crimes, um, it's really important to know what anti-Semitism is. And what we're finding, I think, especially on, in the campus space, is if anything, without understanding the new forms of anti-Semitism, that chilling effect, that curtailing effect, actually often falls on Jewish students and Jewish activists who feel either afraid to openly identify as Jewish or are barred from participating in progressive causes because of their uh, attachment to Israel. Um, so that was one important thing I would note. And it's also not a legally binding definition. It's, it's you know, even when it's referenced in US government policy, it's, recommend, it's um, referenced as a recommended for consideration, not as a, not as a legal obligation. Mm -hmm. And then quickly, the second part of your question was about silencing criticism of Israel. Um, some opponents of the definition, they actually will say that the entire purpose of this definition is only to shield Israel from criticism. And, and they, they point to the fact that um, seven, seven of the 11 examples mention Israel, which is true. Like, I mean, what, one of them actually doesn't mention Israel, but it's alluding to, to, to Israel. But that argument is actually highly misleading because if you read the examples, five of the seven that mention Israel also explicitly mention Jews. Um, and four of them deal actually specifically with how anti-Semitic ideas can be cloaked in Israel-related language. Kind of the same thing kind of with the, the Verpital case. Like these include examples such as like inc accusing Jews as a people or Israel as a state, so there's that Israel mention, of inventing or exaggerating the Holocaust. I would hope people would think that's anti-Semitic, but that's an Israel, ex that's an Israel example. Um, or holding Jews collectively responsible for the action of the state of Israel, which is something we happen, saw in Europe, like where these, these Jews were being attacked, like physically attacked, um, and it wasn't being called anti-Semitic. I would hope that people would, would see that as, as anti-Semitic. As anti um, but the definition also clearly states that overall context must be taken into account, um, and it, it says could. They're not, like, they're meant to be an aid, not a prescriptive text. Like, it's, it's all in context. And I'll, I'll mention just one last, um, one last example, and that this is one that gets people like I think the kind of the most controversial one has to do with double standards. Um, the diligent um, declaring Israel as a racist endeavor is also the, the other one, but applying double standards. The drafters wrote those examples in because of instances where something, there, there was an instance of that double standard being anti-Semitic. And I think we often point to, you know, what happened at the, the UN Human Rights Council, right? Where there is Israel is singled out for, you know, blistering criticism and, and criticism on its own, like, 
um, you know, Senator uh, uh, Wiener said, like, it's, that, that's okay. But when you're not criticizing, you know, the world's most notorious human rights violators, some who actually sit on that very council, um, there is that double standard there, right? And that's that example. Now, there are other instances where that might not be anti-Semitic, and that's where that context piece comes in. And it's, it's, it's meant to be working, it's meant to be used. And there are governments in Sweden and in Spain, for instance, whose governments in power are much further left than our democratic party. They have adopted and fully implemented the iron definition. They see it as protecting their Jewish communities. And let me tell you, they, they, they withhold no, no vitriol <laughs> against criticizing Israeli policy. So they're really, I don't see a contradiction um, between, between the two. Interesting. Um, so I'm very much a progressive. I spend time on progressive spaces on Facebook. You know, I'm a, an activist in the Democratic Party. I was a delegate for Bernie Sanders back in 2016. Um, and, and I've heard many of my fellow progressives reference Kenneth Stern, that when he was with AJC, he, was, he apparently was one of the lead drafters of what is now the IHRA definition. He's referenced by some as, as actually opposing the IRA definition. Can you shed some light on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I don't know uh, Ken personally, um, although I hope to meet him one day. Uh, he actually had a very similar role at AJC as I do now. Like we're, I'm focusing on domestic anti-Semitism. He was focusing on domestic anti-Semitism and specifically also on college campus. And Ken was part of this original coalition that was like, you know, working on the definition back in 2004. There were other experts at AJC, there were policy experts actually in the UK, Germany, academics that were in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and they kind of formed this, this coalition. And Ken was like instrumental in um, basically collecting the various drafts from these different, these different uh, people, you know, organizing them, um, helping them move toward a consensus agreement. Um, so absolutely involved in the process. I, I've heard some of his um, concerns. And again, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think I'll nail them like two of them down. The first is on the, the original purpose. So um, he, and, and the second is on possible misuse. So with the original purpose, the, the, the request for a definition first came from a monitoring center. It was the European um, Union like a monitoring center, uh, the EUMC, and uh, they were trying to track anti-Semitic hate crimes and really no, no more apples and oranges with these different countries reporting different things. Um, that was the first ask. But as that definition was being developed, it, it really quickly um, became needed by, by others that had real world need to fight anti-Semitism. So police, prosecutors, judges, um, again, to determine that anti-Semitic motivation um, in criminal acts, uh, educators. And, and it really for like the first time, it was a, a refocus on, on even the victim themselves. For the first time, the victim's perspective was kind of taken into this, this definition, which I think is a model that even Europe is trying to, to do with for, for anti-Roma, for other forms of, of hatred and and bigotry. So even before the definition was fully formed, it was be beginning to be understood and used by other entities besides the, the this original monitoring center. But if that was the uh, first ask did come from this monitoring center. And I think um, the fact that it's being expanded beyond it um, was one of, of, of Ken's, Ken's concerns. But then we, we do already know though that Jewish communities have been able to be better protected because, because of its expanse beyond the monitoring center. So I, I do still see its use, um, you know, much more than just just monitoring. I think the real concern is misuse, possible misuse, and misuse, and and um, we we have seen it be be invoked in in, in, a, in a couple of inappropriate ways. Um, but like any educational tool, you know, the working definition it, it can be misused. I, I have a colleague um, who actually a colleague who helped who worked with Ken on the definition, who 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 kind of made it made a joke, but you know, he said, you know, I have knives in my kitchen. Should I throw them out because they could possibly be misused? And it's like, haha, that's not. But like the point being is, you know, there's been, we have to focus on what the IRA definition does do. And we have to, you know, when it's been misused, we have to say, no, you can't silence criticism of Israel. You can't use this as a political, if you're on the right, you can't use this as a political weapon or ammunition against the left. That's not appropriate. That's not what the, the, the definition's for. Um, it's really for to help empower victims and society at large to identify otherwise undetected forms of, of anti-Semitism. Uh, and we really are seeing it help Jewish communities around the world. And in fact, uh, we know actually we have data from like the early 2000s in, in the UK where Jewish communities were afraid to go to the police, like afraid to go to the police. They didn't, they, in part because the police would say, oh, you don't, you know, go back to Israel or you don't belong here. You're not, you know, these kinds of real issues. But I don't think we have as much in America, which we need to be very thankful for. Um, 
but the the all the police in the UK have been now trained with the IRA definition in their training and their in their, in their police manuals, and we're actually seeing a, a a higher rate of reporting and trust in law enforcement, which is exactly what we want to see with the IRA definition. Very interesting. Well, I, I could go on and on with questions, but we have a lot more people to hear from, and I I wanted to just just underline see add and ask if I'm correct in saying this that the IRA definition is not legally binding. It isn't anything that is codified into law. It's meant as a guide to identify acts of anti-Semitism. That was its original purpose. There, we can talk also about how some states have made resolutions or have brought it into laws and, and what that means in, in practicality. Um, but yes, it is an educational resource. It is a guide and we need to tell people what anti-Semitism can, can, look, can look like uh, in the 21st century. Thank you so much. Of course, Susan. Beautiful, awesome. So what an amazing first segment, so much that I didn't even know myself. So it's really exciting to just keep on learning together. Um, and so with that, I'm now proud to introduce my co-delegate from AD45, um, Kiyomi, if you wanna go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Vic. Um, good evening, Boker Tov to you, uh, Victoria. Um, I want to uh, start by acknowledging the elephant in the room, which is me. I am the darkest person on this panel. Um, so I think it's important to state why I'm here, occupying all of my space as a proud, Black, progressive Jewish woman. I am new to party politics, and Aiden's was my first foray into this space. Um, I work as an anti-racism and anti-bias educator, and a lot of the work that I do is with synagogues, um, attempting to make more inclusive spaces for Jews of color. And I bring that lens to everything that I do. I can smell sexism, racism, and anti-Black bias from a mile away, but prior to this process through the ADIMS, um, I was not so attuned to the smell of anti-Semitism. Um, when I observed the way fellow progressive um, Democrats spoke about Jews and the nation state of Israel, I knew I had to use my voice to disrupt destructive tenor of these conversations because this too is my fight. Um, I also think it's important to stay at the table and in conversation because this is how we create um, an inclusive environment, um, as well as lasting and sustainable change. I want to be clear that we will not solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, tonight, or from the California Democratic Party, for that matter. Um, but I think we can do a better job talking about this complex and nuanced issue um, without falling into anti-Semitic tropes and traps that derail this important conversation. So we can stop this from being a wedge issue. Um, to divide people who agree on most things and stop this from getting in the way of what is urgently needed for Californians, such as universal health care and criminal justice reform, and the list goes on. Um, I also want to make it clear that I don't represent all Black people or all Jewish Black Jewish people, for that matter. Uh, my experiences are specific to me, and these experiences inform my awareness of and my commitment to dismantle both racism and anti-Semitism. My goal is to ensure that we can all bring um, our whole selves to every table and every conversation with the, within the California Democratic Party. And let there be no Democrat um, who should ever leave parts of their identity at the door as a progressive in the state of California. I deeply believe this is there is strength in our diversity and we should always be united in progress. So with that, I brought my friend, Rochelle, and I wanna tell you about her. Um, uh, Rochelle Robbins is uh, just an incredible person. I had the fortune of uh, working with her on a panel, or excuse me, a workshop I produced um, at Valley Outreach Synagogue here in Calabasas. Um, she's the vice president, dean of um, the chaplaincy school at um, Academy for Jewish Religion. Rabbi Rochelle Robbins also serves as the director of the school's clinical pastoral education program. She earned her Simca at uh, HUC, um, Jewish Institute of Religion in 1998. Uh, Rabbi Robbins previously served as the rabbinic staff chaplain at the hospital at the University of 
Pennsylvania and the supervisor of pastoral education and co-coordinator of the Jewish Hospice Program at Samaritan Hospital in Southern New Jersey. She is a certified educator of clinical pastoral education. Uh, Rabbi Robbins was the co-founder and executive director of Bat Kol, an um, organization that uh, began as Jerusalem's first feminist yeshiva, and then expanded its mission to include interfaith coalition building and healthcare education in the United States. Whether, whether Rabbi Robbins is teaching text, um, assisting patients and family members, training chaplains, or administering social entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial projects, healing and wholeness are at the heart of her rabbinate. I brought Rabbi Rochelle Robbins with me tonight because of her commitment to anti-bias and anti-racism work. And I am thrilled to call her a friend. Welcome, Rabbi. Hi, thank you, Kiyomi. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. Great, give us a bit about yourself. Open up, tell us, tell us something about you. I told you this would be a conversation. She was very nervous and I was like, I'm more of an Oprah than a Diane Sawyer, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, these are huge topics to, to talk about online. And I like to tell my students that, you know, we get together in our clinical reflections to improve our care, um, to, to learn and to chew on things and to hear how things come across. And when you're live and on Facebook and talking about anti-Semitism, um, I feel that there's a little bit um, less leeway. And I think one of my main concerns is that we create the leeway and we create environments in order to have conversations to create deeper healing when it comes to these kinds of topics. So I am so thrilled to be around you who are working on policy and change and education. And I too am in the field of education and I am also in the field of addressing pain and hurt and, and grief and um, in helping people become more reflective so we can learn to get out of our own way and create deeper and better relationships with one another. Now, do I have it down? I don't necessarily have it down, um, but, but it is you know, part of my life's work to do that within myself and to help others. So that's a little about myself. Yeah, no, I love that. That's a lot about you. It gives us a great place to start. Um, you know, we became acquainted, um, like I said, uh, after I reached out to you <clears throat> after doing a, a, a workshop at Valley Outreach Synagogue um, just last year. Um, and we connected because I really wanted to talk to you about Jews and whiteness, um, because I noticed through um, anti-racism work, specifically in the Jewish community, that's a tough hurdle for a lot of Jews to overcome is to see themselves um, in, in whiteness. Um, and, you know, I, you sent me this incredible piece that you wrote, um, and, I, you know, we'll go a bit more in, into that tonight. Um, but, you know, I, I want to talk about bifurcating um, anti-Semitism and, um, and racism and, and, and why they should be bifurcated and where they actually come together and how are the treatments different uh, of both, um, you know, and you and I do this work in a you know more of a pastoral setting for you and I do it in uh, in synagogue spaces so um just from your from your perspective what you know how how do the two should be they be treated differently or similarly well it's an excellent question and i would say that both are traumatizing to people you know we're constantly dealing with the particular and the universal and I think we need to honor both. We need to honor the individual experiences that people have based on privilege and lack thereof. We need to hear people's stories. I, I'm not sure really that, that there is a difference in the sense that, that um, racism and anti-Jewish sentiment or anti-Semitism cause, cause pain. But I think we need to create an educational system and a conversation that allows people to talk about particularism, what is particular to them, and what is universal, and to have those not be elements of conversations that are, that are competitive, that we can learn to honor the difference 
and we can honor the similarity of, of the pain that people endure as the result of both. I think at times we end up creating, um, a, a, we're locked into language and, and language is becoming more and more locked. How can we create methodologies for people to have conversations to get out of the language and semantic lock. Now, language is freeing. Labels can be freeing. Talking about identities can be freeing. There is a point, though, when, again, we can become trapped and, and knotted in, in those definitions. So how can we, again, honor the particular labels and experiences while opening it up to have universal experiences and not letting what we see as privilege and not victimhood, um, being a victimizer, these, these clear cut definitions that we're gaining when that again locks the conversation rather than opens it up. Absolutely, I know, I can completely see that. And I, I think both of us are, oh, who we've got? Um, I, I think both of us are, um, attempting to be in conversation all the time in communities where um, there's a lot of trauma um, around. And, and so speaking about these things and uh, can be can be can be difficult because if one is ha has to see themselves in one way at one point, like perhaps a perpetrator and then a victim in another way, it, it, it becomes very tough. Um, and you spoke about some of your experiences in progressive spaces. And, you know, I, I, I mentioned this uh, piece that you wrote. Uh, will you tell me what prompted you to write this piece? It's called Jewish Vulnerability and Progressive Politics and Spiritual Care. Um, what, what prompted you to write it? I have had an array of experiences in my life where I have felt that I have been gathering with people with similar values, which perhaps we do um, have similar values in many ways, um, like-minded individuals. And when the issues of, of Judaism and Israel arise and, and the Jewish people, um, there has been um, a wedge placed in the relationship and there was one very particular circumstance that I think really led me to write this article. I was attending a conference in Belgium, and I write about this in my, in my chapter of the book. It's called Navigating Religious Differences in Spiritual Care and Education. And I was in Belgium, and the conference had nothing to do with, with Israel. It had to do with spiritual care and education and meeting people on their own terms and an international conversation about this. But some of the local program organizers in Belgium decided to do an entire program on, on Israel and um, colonialism and you know, all, of, all of the topics that, that we see coming up you know, in our colleges and universities. And the conference had absolutely nothing to do with this topic. Meanwhile, there was a gentleman there, a pastor, a Lutheran pastor um, who is Palestinian and uh, lives in the Palestine, under the Palestinian Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, they were talking about Israel. They were talking about Israelis and Palestinians. And I just, I had to get up. I had to, I had to leave the room. It, I, I did not expect this. And he walked up to me as he saw me exiting. And I was just exiting for about two minutes to catch my breath because I did want to stay. And he turned to me and he said, well, Rochelle, they're, they're talking about us, aren't they? And I found that to be one of the most compassionate moments I've ever experienced in my life, where he too felt singled out. I didn't exactly feel singled out, I just felt uncomfortable, but he was reaching out to me across this divide that was being created. And so I've, I've witnessed innumerable situations like this, I've heard about innumerable situations like this and among clergy. And so I want to start addressing this in spiritual care and education and beyond. So in your uh, piece, uh, you, you quoted S. Silverman. Is that Sarah Silverman who you quoted? Or who S. S. Silverman? It's Rabbi, it's Rabbi Susan Silverman. Susan Silverman. 
Yes. A different Silverman. Um, so, you know, I want to read this because it resonated so deeply with me. Oh, yes, yes. Um, so this is um, something that uh, Rabbi Susan Silverman wrote. Oh, yes, yes. The anti-Semitism on the left does hurt and scare me more. Um, not that it's worse, just in terms of how I feel um, able to function in the world. It is more, it is much more impactful. Um, Trump types hatred of me means there are people I do not identify with who don't want me. But when the people who are my refuge, those who hold similar values for social justice, um, who I want to make a home with me, um, meaning um, a home in the world, who I long to celebrate for and with when they succeed and build, see me, Israel, Jews, um, as uniquely evil and worthy of being pointed out, um, Haman style, whether we are relevant or not uh, to the issue at hand. I fear that I have no home in the, the world at large. So I, you know, I connected with that, um, you know, just through the 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 aid in process and 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 seeing some really. Uh, painful things that I had never uh, seen before. I was always, you know, I've always been very proud to be Jewish. And um, when, uh, when I heard about the way um, Israel was being critiqued and which, uh, you know, look, I like to critique things all day, okay? I ain't no Netanyahu fan neither, but, uh, <laughs> but there are ways to do that that don't invoke uh, tropes and um, anti-Semitic uh, ideas and anti-Jewish sentiment. And uh, I was definitely uh, shocked by that. Um, so, you know, do you feel like you have a home in the progressive? First of all, let me ask, are you progressive, Rabbi Rochelle? We'll I would there. say I would say that I'm progressive. Yes. Yeah. Do do you feel a, a home, or, or what, when is that? And if you don't, um, when do you have that tension? Do I feel a home where in the progressive in the progressive world? movement? Yeah. Well, I can say that it's in relationship. I feel at home with you now, Kiyomi, and I feel mm -hmm. at home in this beautiful gathering that that we're having. I think for me, that's the kind of home that I would like leaders like us to, to build curriculum about in order to teach people to, to have these kinds of relationships. Meaning, you know, even though we all consider ourselves to be like-minded, there can be mm -hmm. gaps in community. There's often group mm -hmm. dynamics. There are, there are places of joy where we meet. There are places of pain where we meet. We need to learn to, to, to speak according to our intentions and to move beyond you know, some of the obstacles that are often placed before relationships in this very polarized society that we're living in now. But it isn't entirely polarized because all of us, we're building, we're building relationships. And I believe that in the, the field of chaplaincy and spiritual care, we can actually help um, the the political world, we can help human dynamics in in learning how to to have conversations across even belief systems. That's beautiful, and I, I mean that's what I intend to do every day. So, um, how do we do that? Um, what what are your ideas on how we uh, make this relationally a, a space where everyone feels like they can belong and they feel possibly celebrated for all of our differences? Well, personally, and this is a little bit perhaps specific to my field, uh, I think, and yet I wonder if it can be broadened. I think that there are ways to teach people reflective practices, individual and communal reflective practices to be able to stay in relationship when conversations become difficult or, or even when they, they feel impossible. But that requires, or I won't say but, and that requires, I think conjunctions matter, and that requires you know, a very um, deep commitment to, to personal work and communal work. So I, you know, the reason I said, I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm casting my lot. So I, I, I mentioned that this is my first time in uh, uh, like, 
democratic politics. I became an Emerge alum, what, three years ago? And that's when I declared that I was a Democrat. So, right, um, I am new to all of this. Um, so, I, welcome. You know, I, well, thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I the, the I, I want to make sure that we are a space where people feel at home because I cast, I, you know, I locked myself to the Jewish people and I locked myself to the progressive people, right? And I want to make sure that we are living our values as, as progressive, creating um, spaces where everyone feels that they can show up authentically. And, um, you know, I, 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 I think that we can do it through what we're doing right now, conversation like dialogues and education. I think so, because I also think, I think um, progressives have their hearts in the right places, uh, right? So I think if we set up a binary, they're always gonna take the side of what is uh, considered to be the downtrodden. Um, you know, and I'm just talking, but you know, I told you we'd have a conversation. So what are your thoughts around that? You know, progressives coming from the uh, you know a, a a good a good place, and can we start with education? And I, of course, dialogue. Well, I think that we owe it to our community as progressives and as Jews to promote the Jewish pedagogy of a multiplicity of voices being not only allowed uh, but being readily invited. You know, there are two, um, you know, Talmudic schools of thought that are that are talked about very often in the Jewish community, and it's the, the schools of Hillel and Shammai in the Talmud, and they were often at odds with each other. And so there, there is a question about why um, Hillel is, um, is invited or his rulings are, are respected more and adhered to more. And one of the reasons that people give is that he always taught Shammai's version and viewpoints first. His opponent's view was always welcome at the table first. This is core to Jewish pedagogy and ed education and Jewish life, is, is inviting a multiplicity of voices into the room. This is foundational to our tradition. And I think it's a passion that we need to to reclaim in both Jewish and civil discourse. And we not only need to reclaim it, but perhaps there's a way that we can teach it. Perhaps there's a way that we can demonstrate it more. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I don't know if it's me. Am I causing this sound or does anybody else hear it? Am I like making, so every time I do that, you guys don't hear me. <laughs> I seem like a paranoid person. I'm sorry. That's really crazy. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah. So, Rabbi Rochelle, um, I will let you uh, close this out from our, uh, you know, my paranoid thoughts. Are there, is there anything that you felt here tonight that you would like to share or, you know, that you would like to leave us with? Well, I, I believe that the point that I just address about finding ways to increase conversations with people with whom we feel at odds is something that that we can offer. And you know, there's a line in Torah, and it's uh, said during the morning, and it's Or Hadash Al Tzion Ta'ir Veniskeh Kulanu Bimhera Elro, and it's um, shine a new light on Zion and may all of us soon be worthy of enlightenment. And I think, you know, I'm not looking at Zion as a literal, as Zion as a literal concept in this place, but it's, it's, a, it's a state. And, and somehow, you know, each group of people has its enlightenment to offer. And, and I would say that um, we Democrats and we Jewish Democrats may have I'm not gonna ever say should, but we may have a responsibility somehow to, to create a more open table for, for conversations that, that are difficult. And we have this in our ancient, ancient tradition, we have it in our contemporary tradition, and uh, I believe that there are ways to bring this to the forefront of, of discourse in our society. 
Thank you, Rabbi Rochelle, my friend, my rabbi. Um, Thank you. I'm going to pause. I'm going to go on mute and I'm going to send it back to Susan. Thank you. And I will send it back to Victoria. <laughs> That's okay. We can just keep rotating with it uh, throughout the night, everyone. <laughs> Um, beautiful. I found that to be such a, an interesting segment and um, it's actually really refreshing to get a little uh, Jewish and textual perspective on things um, in a lot of ways. So, so thank you for that, Rabbi. Um, now I'm really excited to introduce an amazing, amazing student leader, one of my former classmates who is currently putting in so much work at UCLA, but really just in the Jewish community beyond. Um, and so, Chloe, I would love if you could introduce yourself a little bit, talk a little bit about your background, um, and then we will start our segment with Vlad. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Victoria. My name is Chloe Levion. I'm a campus liaison at Stand With Us, and I'm on the board of Bruins for Israel and Bruins for Israel's Public Affairs Committee. I grew up in Los Angeles, where there is the biggest population of Persian Jews in the world. However, when I'm outside of my LA bubble, people are confused by my identity. They often ask me, when did I convert? Because being from Iran and being Jewish sounds bizarre to most in a lot of my teachers growing up. Jews have lived in Iran since 586 BCE and they were second class citizens during the best of times and a persecuted minority during the worst. My grandfather grew up in Hamadan where there was a certain set of laws for Jews. Jews were not allowed to go outside when it rained or snowed because they were seen as najisat, which means ritually impure. And they believed that their impurities would be transmitted on Muslim Iranians. They were forbidden from wearing matching shoes, cutting their beards, and so many more ridiculous anti-Semitic laws. Jews were seen as though they do not belong in Iran, even though we have lived there for 2,500 years. Their presence was not accepted, it was tolerated, and they were probationary Iranians. Right before the Iranian revolution, thankfully, my mother and her family fled to Israel. And after 2,500 years of living in Iran, I was a part of the first generation of my family to be born in the United States. Additionally, as a college student in Los Angeles, I have experienced my fair share of anti-Semitism. I was excluded from the Intersectional Feminist Alliance Club on their table at Club Row. It said, we oppose sexism, racism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, Zionism. And in, August, in April of last year, my peers and I were scapegoated for bringing COVID-19 to our campus. In 2019, according to the ADL, there were 186 anti-Semitic incidents on college campuses. And California is one of those states with the most anti-Semitic incidents. There has been an increase in incidents since 2013, from 751 in 2013 to over 2,100 in 2019, the highest number on record. So now is a great time to be a Jewish California college student. I now have the privilege of introducing Vlad Haiken. Vlad Haiken serves as the National Director of Programs on Anti-Semitism at the Anti-Defamation League. A former refugee from state-sponsored anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union and a grandson of Holocaust survivors, Vlad holds ADL's work to secure justice and fair treatment for all deeply personal. Take it away, Vlad. Thanks very much, Chloe. Uh, and thanks for, uh, to uh, everyone for being here tonight and, and uh, taking some time to learn about um, anti-Semitism in our society today and its impact on Jewish communities. Um, I was born in a part of the world uh, where uh, nine out of every 10, 10 Jews were murdered during the Holocaust. Um, I'm a, a grandson of Holocaust survivors. Um, in fact, my, my grandfather um, was somebody who, who fought fascists across Europe. Uh, he helped liberate Warsaw and ultimately um, helped to take the Reichstag and, and um, war, the war on, on the uh, Western Front. When he returned uh, to his home in the Soviet Union, returned from uh, fighting the war in Germany, um, he was called a Zionist fascist. 
despite having uh, helped to liberate uh, the the world from uh, from the peril of fascism, um, you see, in, in the Soviet Union, um, Jews were treated as second class citizens, maybe even third class citizens. Um, now, in in the Soviet Union, uh, World War II loomed very large, uh, much more so even in the than in the United States. Um, everyone had somebody that they lost um, to uh, to the war. Um, and so uh, to call somebody a fascist was basically the worst thing that you could possibly call somebody. Um, and at the same time, um, anti-Semitism became, became something that was um, sort of uh, to share in the uh, ideology of the Nazis, right? Anti-Semitism was so core to the Nazi ideology that um, to be an anti-Semite was to share in that ideology that so many uh, Soviet citizens had given their lives fighting. Um, and so it, it became very much um, uh, taboo. However, the official policy of the Soviet Union uh, was anti-Zionist because, of course, anti-Semitism uh, is a useful political tool, uh, and so people weren't going to give it up so easily. So, uh, in in the Soviet Union, um, you know, uh, everyone sort of uh, knew that uh, if you were if people recognized you as Jewish, uh, you would be subjected to um, all kinds of discrimination uh, in housing and employment, uh, in education. Right. Um, you know, everybody carried uh, an identity card uh, by law. You had to carry an identity card with you. And um, if you were so unfortunate as to have your ethnicity labeled there as Jewish, um, you would face uh, all kinds of persecution, uh, discrimination and, and in fact, violence. Um, you know, Jewish life was choked in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, it was what I would c consider a, a sort of uh, attempted cultural genocide. Um, Jewish theaters and other cultural institutions were shuttered, uh, synagogues were closed down, uh, speaking the Hebrew language or even trying to learn the Hebrew language became uh, illegal, uh, observing the Sabbath, observing Passover was criminalized, um, all of this in the name of anti-Zionism. Uh, Stalin said in the 1950s that every Jewish nationalist, that is every person who uh, identifies uh, with Jews as a national identity, um, was a agent of American imperialism. And that was the environment in which we lived, right? Um, and at the same time, we weren't allowed to leave. And so um, something called the Soviet Jewry movement um, was mounted by uh, activists all around the world. Um, and it helped to, to liberate me and my family and, and countless other Soviet Jews um, after decades of activism and agitation and lobbying um, and legislative advocacy. In other words, my freedom wasn't free. It was purchased with uh, you know, uh, the, the vigor and the, the blood, sweat, and tears of activists. And I, I see my work at the ADL today um, very much as trying to repay uh, or, or perhaps pay forward to the next generation of people persecuted for being born who they are um, you know, in the same way that the activists who came uh, before me paid it forward to me to be able to, to live as a, as a free uh, uh, individual and to practice Judaism, to speak my, my native language, um, and so on. And so um, I, I you know, understand very well that um, it was through these coalitions, which uh, were you know, certainly many activists within the Jewish community, but many people outside of the Jewish community who understood um, that none of us are free until all of us are free and that injustice anywhere, whether here in the United States or somewhere halfway around the world, um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so many people who, that came out of the civil rights movement became uh, involved uh, with the, the, the struggle to free Soviet Jewry, um, including Dr. King himself, including Bayard Rustin, uh, who's known as the architect of the civil rights movement, um, and many others. And so, um, you know, in the spirit of, of uh, this gathering today, which is really about, you know, forming those coalitions and understanding the ways in which um, bigotry of any sort, whether anti-Semitism, misogyny, homophobia, Islamophobia, um, help, you know, it, it undermines our movements. It undermines our ability to, to really uh, advance towards the kind of society that we all um, want to live in. So um, I'm going to uh, now share a little bit of a, of a presentation. Um, let's see here. One sec. All right. So because our time is uh, together is so short, uh, I want to sort of start with a conceptual uh, overview of, of things that I think it's really important for us as sort of uh, people, you know, in, in left of center politics, right, progressives, people who are interested in um, you know, advancing social, uh, political and economic um, equality in this country, things that we need to be aware of, right? 
Um, and then we'll take a look at how these things actually play out in the real world, including um, how they played out in the Soviet Union um, and, and the, the sort of environment um, that ultimately rendered me and my family and so many others um, uh, refugees. And we had to flee our, our, our homes as a result of this. So number one, uh, anti-Semitism is adaptive. Right, anti-Semitism isn't just one thing. This is really important to to remember. Um, we, you know, in we tend to think of ourselves uh, on the left as as sort of inherently anti-racist, right? How could we possibly um, be susceptible to anti-Semitism? Um, you know, but it's important to understand that anti-Semitism finds fertile soil across the political spectrum because it's able to adapt to different social, political, and religious contexts. Chameleon-like. Uh, it takes the form that reflects uh, the particular uh, milieu, the, the zeitgeist or worldview among which it emerges, right? In other words, it will tend to take the form that will carry the greatest currency in situ, meaning that um, anti-Semitism will um, brand itself and present itself in the way that is most appealing to you, each one of you, right? Based on your particular understanding of the world uh, and, and what are its, its uh, social, political or other ills. Because anti-Semitism is adaptive, um, oftentimes it is sort of irrational and paradoxical. It will uh, tend to give justifications for why, Jew, um, why people hate Jews or, or want to persecute Jews that are oftentimes contradictory, right? So let's take a look. On the one hand, Jews are blamed uh, for capitalism, right, for all the failures of capitalism. This was very much true uh, in, the, uh, in the Soviet Union, right? Um, and on the other hand, uh, Jews will be blamed for the failures of socialism or communism. On the one hand, Jews are blamed for being too pacifistic, for being unwilling to defend their nation. Again, we heard this a lot in the Soviet Union. And on the other hand, Jews will be blamed for being too militaristic, right? For being warmongers. We hear this a lot today uh, applied to, uh, to the Jewish state. On the one hand, Jews are um, hated for being unpatriotic, right? For being rootless cosmopolitans, as they call, called us in the Soviet Union. And on the other hand, Jews are hated for being too nationalistic, right? Again, we hear this uh, with regard to Zionists and, and other supporters uh, of the state of Israel today. On the one hand, Jews are branded as, as racists and ethnic supremacists. And on the other hand, for promoting multiculturalism, right? For pushing race mixing and miscegenation. And of course, uh, on the one hand, Jews are told to go back to Israel or Palestine, and on the other hand, told to get out of Israel and Palestine. In other words, anti-Semitism will adapt itself to the particular uh, political, social, religious, or other worldview where it emerges. Number three, anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory. Um, it, it's not mere prejudice or racial animus. It's a conspiracy theory based in the idea that Jews have uh, extraordinary power with which they conspire to harm or control those outside the Jewish community. Um, and it, as a result of this, it's frequently a motivation for scapegoating Jews as the cause of a variety of societal problems. So uh, for example, we see this um, uh, here, uh, this meme that I pulled from a, a white supremacist site on the internet that blames Jews for everything from, from sex traffic and pornography to um, wars for Israel to um, you know, corporate malfeasance and, and, and Wall Street misdeeds um, and so on. Right. It's important to understand um, that one thing that makes anti-Semitism distinct uh, from other forms of bigotry, and each form of bigotry needs to be understand uh, needs to be understood both in terms of its commonalities that it shares with other forms of bigotry and oppression, as well as in its particularity. We can't sort of like all lives matter, right? This issue. Um, so each form has something that makes it unique. What makes anti-Semitism unique? is that unlike um, the anti-Black racist or the uh, sexist, the target of anti-Semitism um, is not considered to be inferior, right? Um, you know, for the anti-Black racist or for the sexist, um, the, you know, Black folks, women, they are considered to be inferior to them, right? They're not as smart, they're not as capable, et cetera. For the anti-Semite, it's quite different. Um, to the anti-Semite, the Jew is not inferior, perhaps morally inferior, right? Avaricious, greedy, um, you know, et cetera. Um, maybe, uh, you know, in some other ways, um, but, but quite powerful, right? Almost supernaturally powerful. And as a result of this, um, this, this has particular implications for us um, as progressives, right? Because, um, you know, anti-Semitism uh, in, in alleging to punch up at its targets uses the language of emancipation, right? It's a, it's a pseudo-emancipatory movement. It uses the language of liberation. 
right? So uh, it, that poses a, a sort of danger to any of us that are invested in um, social change, in economic change, in political change, right? Um, because it alleges to, uh, to speak truth to power and identify the source of our suffering among the Jews. Moish Pastone, um, uh, the late Moish Pastone, a, a, a Marxist sociologist, said that anti-Semitism has a pseudo-emancipatory dimension. It is therefore toxic to all movements that seek to develop a genuine critique of capitalism and oppression, okay? Number five, um, anti-Semitism can be conscious and overt or unconscious and implicit, right? And the latter is, is uh, more often than not the case, right? Um, so something can be anti-Semitic in intent, in form, or in impact. Um, in other words, something can be anti-Semitic even when it's not animated by anti-Jewish animus, right? Um, we may not even be aware of the fact that we're being anti-Semitic, right? Um, and, and certainly many forms of anti-Semitism are aired um, unwittingly, right? Um, but just because somebody does not intend to do harm does not mean that no harm was caused. We have to, not we have to look not only at intent, but also at impact, right? Um, and anti-Semitism, you know, it, it's part of the air we breathe, like other bigotries. It sort of hangs in the air like a virus. And at some point, if we're honest with, with ourselves, we have to admit that we all become infected with these ideas to varying degrees, right? Um, our job, however, is to make sure we don't breathe it back out and infect others and propagate this virus, right? Um, Barbara Smith, the queer black uh, feminist, said that I am anti-Semitic. I have swallowed anti-Semitism simply by living here, whether I wanted to or not. Right. So we have to admit that even on the left, where we tend to think of ourselves as sort of inherently anti-racist, um, that is actually a barrier to us properly understanding and being able to deal with anti-Semitism. Because the, the truth of the matter is, all of these things exist on the left, right? They exist in progressive spaces, whether it's misogyny, whether it's racism, whether it's homophobia, uh, whether it's uh, anti-Semitism. These things exist, and we have to be honest about that. Number six, anti-Semitism is often political, right? Um, you know, uh, anti-Semitism is something that has been wielded as a political tool, both on the left and the right, for many, many centuries, right? Um, and and it, particularly on the left, it, it has always been there. One can talk about, for example, Karl Marx, right, um, in his remarks on the Jewish question, right? Um, what is the, the god of the Jews? It's it's capital, it's money, right? Um, Hucksterism is his, is his religion. Um, we could talk about, you know, the founders of uh, sort of libertarian socialist thought or anarchism, right? Like Joseph Proudhon or Bakunin, who were vicious anti-Semites. So it's always been there, and we can't sort of delude ourselves um, that it's not there uh, or is something new. Um, and, um, you know, but it's really important to understand anti-Semitism should never be politicized. It shouldn't ever be turned into a game of political football where we only use it um, and we only care about it insofar as it's useful to attack our opponents um, across the aisle, right, on the other side of the political spectrum. Um, and, you know, anti-Semitism, we see this today, both on the left and the right. It's still part of our politics, right? Um, you know, uh, we've see, we saw the way that anti-Semitism helped fuel the riots at the Capitol on January 6th. Right, um, which you can see here with this gentleman wearing a Camp Auschwitz uh, hoodie. Number seven, uh, um, anti Semitism is a canary in the coal mine. Um, in 2019, uh, Ahmed Shahid, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion, um, said this at the UN General Assembly. He said, anti Semitism is a canary in the coal mine. It is toxic to democracies and a threat to all societies if left unaddressed. It's important to understand that anti-Semitism isn't really about Jews. I'll say that again, anti-Semitism is not about Jews. Anti-Semitism is um, a malady of the non-Jewish collective, right? The Jew of the anti-Semitic imagination is a fantasy. It's a construct of the non-Jewish imagination and is a reflection of the, you know, um, the biases, the trepidations, the anxieties, the feelings of disenfranchisement of the non-Jewish collective. And similarly, um, anti-Semitism, although it uses Jews as the object, um, the, the content of its bigotry, um, it doesn't only impact Jews. Certainly Jews are the direct targets, but anti-Semitism is broadly corrosive to our institutions, to our democratic uh, norms um, uh, and, and broader society, right? We know historically that anti-Semitism never, uh, never shows up alone. It comes with an entourage of authoritarianism, right? Anti-intellectualism, contempt for scholarship, science for expertise, um, you know, and, and the consequent proliferation of conspiracy theories, as well as the propagation of other forms of bigotry uh, and xenophobia, which always accompany anti-Semitism and which anti-Semitism helps diffuse.
fuel. Right in the last number of years, um, you know, Chloe mentioned some of the statistics from ADL. You know, the way that anti-Semitism has grown in our society um, in the last number of years. Well, at the same time, we've all probably noticed that all of these other things have also happened. Right, attacks on the free press, erosion of democratic norms, various conspiracy theories, whether about COVID, uh, the QAnon stuff, right, um, and the proliferation of other forms of bigotry. Hate crimes are up across the board. Right, it's not just the Jewish community that's feeling the heat. Right, so we have to understand the, that. Anti-Semitism is a threat not just to Jews. It's it's something that um, we all have a stake uh, right in this fight. So to understand anti-Semitism, you have to understand the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, uh, which is really the blueprint for contemporary anti-Semitism. It was first published in 1903 by the Akhrana, which is the Sara Secret uh, Service, um, uh, which is you know which uh, which was a right wing reactionary um, sort of body, right? Um, it was created to undermine social movements. At the time, there was all kinds of liberal, democratic, socialist, anarchist, communist, and other movements that were challenging the power of the monarchy, um, and that were calling for a more equitable, more democratic society. In order to undermine those movements and to derail them, um, what what happened was um, they created this propaganda the protocols, um, which alleged that there was an, uh, an, uh, a, a Jewish plot to take over Russia and eventually to take over the world. And they were the ones that were manipulating con and controlling these uh, progressive social movements, right? Um, and we hear echoes of that today in the way that um, people have accused, for example, George Soros, a Jewish philanthropist, of funding and controlling the Black Lives Matter movement paying protesters to riot and loot with the idea that um, actually there's no, this movement isn't a grassroots movement to shine a light on the pervasive issues of racism in our criminal justice system. No, this is a plot of the Jews to, to stir up civil unrest um, and to undermine our society, right? So we hear echoes of this stuff even today. Um, and that's why it's so important to understand um, this particular uh, piece of propaganda. You, you know, just recently there was a, a Capitol officer, a Capitol police officer that was suspended after he was found uh, reading this material um, uh, I I within the government building. Now, um, it, here's, here's uh, the kicker. Um, the protocols were taken up um, they were originally created by a right-wing reactionary government, right, for the purposes of undermining movements for social progress and equality. Um, but decades later, they were actually taken up by the new regime that had come to power, the, the Soviet socialist regime, right? And the Soviet regime used it as the basis for its anti-Semitic propaganda, which again, remember, was, uh, uh, was guised as anti-Zionism. But actually, um, the history of the protocols um, it shows that from the very beginning, it was linked to the Zionist movement, right? This, this idea, this reactionary um, uh, racist propaganda that is still sort of, um, you know, read on the racist far right um, and serves as the blueprint for their ideas was taken up by a nominally left-wing progressive regime that was, you know, uh, branded itself as anti-racist and they used it as the basis for their uh, propaganda. And we'll see in a second um, what that looks like. Right. Um, and in fact, the um, the, uh, the publisher who said uh, who, who first published uh, the the protocols said that the, um, these were the the um, the notes from the first Zionist Congress that had ever occurred in the late 1800s. And in fact, um, the uh, the person who was most likely the individual responsible for creating the protocols, who is a, a propagandist doing um, uh, placing pieces pro government uh, pro SAR uh, pieces in the in the press. Once the, the Soviets came to power, the socialists came to power, he switched sides and started doing um, pro-government uh, propaganda, this time for the left, right? So again, anti-Semitism is adaptive. We shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that the things that happen on the left or the right um, will remain on the left or the right. Ideologies, ideas don't stay quarantined. They cross-pollinate and they always have. Um, so, and, and later uh, in the United States, this was brought to the United States by one Henry Ford, who um, was, uh, you know, the, the industrialist Henry Ford, who owned a, uh, a newspaper called the Dearborn Independent, uh, which had a wide circulation. In fact, it had a circulation much wider than Der Sturmer, the, the Nazi publication, which helped uh, prime the, the, the German nation for the, the genocide that ensued. Um, Der Sturmer had a, a, a circulation of about 500,000. Um, the Dearborn Independent had a circulation of 700,000 in the United States. And uh, Henry Ford uh, used it to um, propagate these ideas from that were drawn from the protocols of the lear learned elders of Zion. And Henry Ford also in his in his work, the international uh, Jew 
uh, also linked it to quote unquote Jewish imperialism, that should sound familiar, right? Um, and linked it to, again, Theodore Herzl and the Zionist, uh, um, the Zionist Congress. Um, and oh, and, and, and by the way, uh, I, I should note here that um, you know, the, the Soviet um, intelligence services, the KGB um, and, uh, and GRU and others um, disseminated this propaganda throughout the Middle East. Right, and so that's why so much of what you hear about Zionism, when it sounds so much of the stuff that comes out of the protocols of the learned elders of Zion, this is why it was a huge campaign over the course of decades. So here's a quote from uh, the highest level defector from the Soviet uh, intelligence uh, apparatus. Um, he says, "Imperial Zionism was a Moscow invention." a modern adaptation of the protocols of the learned elders of Zion and a long favorite tool of Russian intelligence to foment ethnic hatred. Every month, the DIE, this was the, the intelligence service he was uh, at the head of, disseminated thousands of copies uh, throughout its Islamic sphere of influence. In other words, they flooded the Middle East and North Africa, including uh, Iran, um, with, uh, with hundreds of thousands of, of Arabic and, and Persian uh, translations of the protocols and linked it directly to, to Zionism. Um, so here, uh, uh, this, this photo, um, the largest photo you see is from uh, a May Day parade in the Soviet Union in the 1970s. And you see um, that, uh, and by the way, the text on the background, which you can't quite see, it's in Russian. Um, I'll translate it for you. It says, Zionism is a weapon of imperialism. And the spider, as you can see, it has this giant, uh, you know, Jewish uh, caricature of a Jewish nose, right? And the Star of David on its head. That looks very much like the cartoons and the uh, and uh, images that came out of Nazi Germany that you see just below that image, as well as uh, one that came from uh, from France. Um, because these people drew on the same texts, they drew on the same themes uh, and images and symbols as the Nazis, explicitly so. So again, um, we can see the way that um, old anti-Semitic tropes um, are recycled, right? And, and projected onto the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, onto Israel, onto Zionists and supporters of Israel, right? The IRA definition that was mentioned earlier and that we talked about, one of the key things it says is that when you apply the classic tropes of uh, anti-Semitism to, um, to Israel, to Zionists, um, et cetera, this is anti-Semitism. This is what it looks like today, right? So on the bottom, you have uh, from left to right, an image from the Soviet Union of this octopus spreading its ten tentacles across the globe. Uh, to the right of that is an, the same image from Nazi Germany. And to the right of that is uh, the same image, this time uh, superimposed over uh, Israel-Palestine, right? Um, uh, from the Arab, uh, from the Arab speaking, uh, Arabic speaking world. Um, uh, and the top row is contemporary versions of that, right? Um, a, a political cartoon from a Brazilian uh, anti-Zionist uh, cartoonist, uh, Carlos Latouf, um, and others on the same theme. Here's uh, the theme of Jewish power and control, which dominates um, so much anti-Semitic thought from left to right. One of the, um, you know, the, the common expression that white supremacists use to refer to this notion that Jews control the U.S. government is the Zog the Zionist occupied government, that language is not incidental, right? Um, it's not by accident that they use these terms, right? And so again, on the bottom row, you see images, uh, historical images from, uh, from Germany, from the Soviet Union, et cetera. And on the top row is the contemporary version of Jews, again, as puppeteers, as uh, this time of Israel, right? This is you have on the left, Ariel Sharon, the former prime minister of Israel, manipulating who? Who are his puppets? The US and the EU, right? The blood libel is another common theme that we see. Uh, on the top left, you see a, a medieval uh, um, version of this, right? You see these Jews cutting up this Christian child and draining its blood. Today, this image is used all the time um, to attack Israel and Zionists as bloodthirsty, as warmongers, as parasitic, as subsisting on the bodies of non-Jews, either literally or figuratively. Right, the most uh, modern iteration of this, uh, which I, I have for you on the on the right, this image is, was pulled from uh, from Facebook. Uh, it was posted by Basim Tamimi, who's a uh, a Palestinian activist, the father of Ahe Tamimi. Um, and he says, when uh, when Israelis arrest Palestinian children, what is the purpose? To steal their organs. This is a modern iteration of, uh, of the anti-Semitic blood libel, right? So we have to understand the way that these ancient tropes continue to, uh, to echo and resonate today. 
Um, and, and lastly here, um, the appropriation of, uh, of the Holocaust, uh, the misappropriation of the Holocaust, the abuse of, of Holocaust memory. This was a common theme in the Soviet Union, which again, um, if you recall, you know, to, you know, in the Soviet Union, to call somebody a Nazi, to call somebody a fascist, there was no worse insult, right? Uh, it was somebody who, for the average uh, Soviet citizen, somebody who was responsible for murdering one of your relatives, right? Because everybody in the Soviet Union lost somebody in that war. Well, uh, you see a couple of images uh, on the bottom from that Soviet period, which compare Israel and Jews uh, and Zionists to Nazis, to fascists. And in fact, during the, the time in the Soviet Union when this, was, this propaganda was most uh, common during the late 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, it was actually more common for Jews to be, um, uh, you know, um, uh, confronted on the street and called a fascist than it was to be called a zhid, which is um, the, how you say kike in Russian, right? So um, these th words have power, right? Um, in the Soviet Union, the, the association of Jews with imperialism, with colonialism, with racism, white supremacy, um, usurpation, exploitation, um, uh, and, and Nazism and fascism led to Jews being marginalized in, in everyday life. People ceased to want to associate with anybody who was, quote unquote, a Zionist Jew. Um, uh, people were chased out of their work, um, out of their professions, out of academia, certainly out of government. There was a huge purge, right? Um, and in fact, it did lead to people being murdered. Um, it, it began um, in 1952 during the Slansky trial. I urge you all to look this up uh, in, in, in the Czech Republic, um, where 13 people were accused of uh, Zionist subversion, right? Um, and were ultimately um, coerced into giving confessions. Um, and most of them were hanged uh, for the crime of Zionism. Um, most of them were actually anti-Zionists and um, people who had fought for socialism. They were progressives. Um, they were most of them were anti-Zionists, and yet, none, nonetheless, um, this this paranoia, this um, this anti-Semitism that spread throughout society by that was spread by the state by political parties um, led to Jews being executed for the crime of Zionism. So I'm going to wrap up my uh, presentation there. Um, I think uh, I'm a little bit over time now, but I'd love to, um, uh, during the Q&A, answer any questions that anybody uh, might have about this presentation. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, thank you, Vlad, so much. Um, and just a reminder to all the participants, if you have a question, feel free to send it in the Q&A portion so that way I can see it. If you're watching on Facebook, feel free to comment. I'm looking there as well. Um, but for our first question, um, we have, and I think Vlad, we might field this to you. And then if any of the other panelists want to comment on this, please, by all means. Um, what do you think of Eric Ward's premise that anti-Semitism is at the core of white supremacy and must be fought in order to end racism, specifically anti-Black racism? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, actually, let me show you um, what he means, right? So here's uh, actually the, that quote from, uh, from that piece, which I commend you all to read uh, by Eric Ward called Skin in the Game. Uh, in it, he lays out uh, his case as to why uh, anti-Semitism is so core uh, to white nationalism. It is the core of white nationalism. He says that anti-Semitism is the fuel that white nationalist ideology uses to power its anti-Black racism, its contempt for other people of color, as well as, as its xenophobia and misogyny and other forms of hatred it holds dear, right? And he adds, Black people will not win our freedom without tearing it down. I would add the corollary that Jewish people will not win our freedom without tearing, it, uh, tearing down white supremacy, anti-Blackness either. Um, we have to understand, again, that these are common threats, right? Um, White supremacy th threatens all of our communities. Um, you know, it, it uses, uh, it sees Jews again as these masterminds, right? Who are um, incredibly powerful, able to manipulate the, you know, global economy, banks, the global media, et cetera, right? And crucially to control black people in order to advance um, what white supremacists see as, you know, all the ills of, you know, PC culture, you know, uh, censorship of speech, you know, um, feminism, all of these things, right? So here's a, a, an image that illustrates this very well. Again, I pulled this from a, a white supremacist forum on the internet. Um, and you see this evil little Jew, right, directing this black sort of automaton, and he has a belt buckle that says social justice warrior. And the Jew is directing this a black person to strangle La Lady Liberty, 
This is white supremacy in an image, right? This is the, what they actually believe, right? And so we have to understand how core anti-Semitism is because if we don't understand it, if we fail to understand um, how anti-Semitism animates white supremacy, we will be uh, left impotent to be able to address it. Um, and I want to say one last thing here about, about this. Um, um, here's a, you know, a, a, a more sort of a pithy iteration of what Eric says, and this is, comes a direct quote from a member of Adam Waff in a white supremacist terror group, actually one of the most violent in the United States. Um, you know, this individual says, Jews are the virus, people of color, homosexuals, they are the symptoms, right? And here you see, again, a number of images um, related to how Jews, uh, white supremacists think Jews are behind the quote unquote gay agenda, how they uh, are allegedly flooding the United States and Europe with Muslims, right? You have a Muslim problem because because you have a Jew problem, um, et cetera. Um, you know, uh, but what I want to say, uh, and here, of course, is uh, you know, white supremacists, the great lovers of, of, of Israel. But um, what I want to really say is, is, is this. Um, uh, Dr. Clarence B. Jones uh, is the, the lawyer and draft speechwriter for MLK. Um, and he, he told me a remarkable thing once. He said that um, the success of the civil rights movement in raising the consciousness of America was enabled by the coalition we had with the American Jewish community. And I'm not just talking about writing checks. People gave their very lives. Um, I don't say that so that we can rest on our laurels. Quite the, quite the opposite, right? Um, uh, it, we have to sort of take the baton from the giants that came before us and understand the power of coalitions. We have to understand the power of solidarity. Um, our, the gains that we've made in this country for equality, for justice, have been made through solidarity and coalitions, right? And we have to understand that. Um, you know, and because we have to understand that because the white supremacists understand that. They took a lesson from the civil rights uh, movement. They saw that when black folks and Jews and others came together, we were able to dismantle uh, the system of legalized white supremacy in this country known as the old Jim Crow. Right. Um, and so they took a lesson from this. And, and since then, they have uh, been engaged in various machinations to try to divide our communities against one another. This is happening as we speak. Here on the, on the top right um, is a, a quote that I pulled from um, one of these white supremacist fora, right, um, uh, Achan and others uh, that we all know about. And they say, we must create a massive movement of fake Jewish profiles on Facebook, Twitter, etc., since the Jews shape shift into whites anytime they want, we want to do the same to them. Um, and they list their goals. And their goals are to create fake Jewish accounts and then tweet out things that will in anger the, the black community and sow division um, and animus between our communities. And these are some of the things that they're doing, right? Um, here on the left is a, a, a meme that is a fake meme that was created by white supremacists that has the ADL logo on it, actually, as you can see. And uh, the, here they're using the Holocaust and uh, race, uh, the, the, the legacy of slavery, right? The most painful periods in black and Jewish um, history, respectively, to try to um, set our communities against one another, right? Um, allegedly, this was, this was uh, of course, tweeted out from a fake Jewish account. You know, some things can't compare, right? Anti-Semitism is on the rise in America and the Holocaust can never be compared to slavery, right? All of these kinds of things that are obviously going to be very painful for uh, black Americans. Um, on the bottom right is, the, is an, a, a poster that was posted in a black neighborhood, right? Never forget, Jewish lives matter most. Obviously, um, you know, playing off of the Black Lives Matter um, line and saying that uh, supposedly Jews care, you know, are, are pushing everybody not to care about black lives, that only Jewish lives matter. So we have to recognize that these things are afoot. They are trying actively to divide our communities against one another because they know when we unite, we win. Don't forget that. Most definitely. And I think that's extremely, extremely powerful. So thank you, Vlad, for that. And I want to actually circle back to this topic. But beforehand, I know that um, Holly is going to have to leave us soon. And so before that, I wanted to actually ask um, you specifically, Holly, that, you know, there are some alternate definitions that some have talked about both within and outside the Jewish community, um, such as the Jerusalem Declaration, Nexus, to, to counteract the IHRA. Um, can you touch a little bit on what the differences are there and maybe what's problematic, what's not problematic, what, what, the, what the discourse is on them? No, of course. And, and I wish I could stay on with you longer. It's, it's, it's almost midnight for me and I'm, I, I might say something I don't remember the next morning, but I, I do know the Jerusalem Declaration, I do know the Nexus document, so I'm, I'm happy to, to share a little bit uh, with, with you. So among some of the critics of, of the IRA working definition, 
some have stepped forward to offer alternative definitions and, and uh, the, the Nexus document, and I mean, you can look it up also, it came out of USC, the Nexus Task Force, I think it came out last early last month, uh, and then the Jerusalem Declaration, which was officially published a few weeks ago in the US, but I actually saw, saw it in December 2000 um, and, and 20. So it's, it's been around for a while, it came out of um, uh, a conference at the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. And others may follow. Uh, they've, they've been drafted and promoted largely by academics, um, many of them who are Jewish, uh, and, and not surprisingly, they focus on examples of anti-Semitism involving Israel. Um, so again, like the IRA definition, brief set of examples, um, you know, warns that these examples may be anti-Semitic, but it depends on context. And it, it, the IRA definition was meant to be short. It was meant to be brief. It was meant to be usable. I think I, I tried to capture that a little bit um, previously. These alternative definitions really devote much attention and considerable verbiage um, to debating where and how to draw that like theoretical line, right? That separates legitimate anti-Israel criticism uh, from anti-Semitism. And as such, like they're, they're far more suitable, I would say, for a university classroom, a rabbinic school seminar, you know, and, and they can be debated in these spaces. Um, but as interesting as they may be, I, I do think they miss the essential purpose of the definition. And again, we're not talking about misuse of the definition. We're talking about why it was created, when it was created, and how it's actually being used properly. Uh, and that's that the flexibility piece, that flexible tool um, to identify anti-Semitism, law enforcement uh, for, for government leaders, et cetera. I, 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 I've made this, uh, this, this quip before. I, I, I can't imagine a police cadet in London you know, when trying to determine anti-Semitic bias as a motivator in a hate crime, like going to guideline C, number 12 of the Jerusalem Declaration, saying, oh, opposition to Zionism is not a form of anti-Semitism, when he's trying, when he's looking at Zionism as racism, that's been graffitied across a synagogue, you know, in, in, in London. It's, it's not helpful there. Um, so I, I think they can offer further instruction, they can, they can um, you know, support the, the IRA definition, but they're not going to be that tool and we're facing a global problem right now. And there's been 30 countries that have adopted the IRA definition that are using it, hundreds of uh, institutions, universities, sports teams, I mean, um, law enforcement agencies around the world. We have to be unified and, 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 and have a kind of a global, at least like a, a universal definition in this space. And I really see that's the path forward. And it's just been actually incredible to see, to see it used and help Jewish communities. Beautiful. Um, that's amazing. And I think kind of a question going off of that and how we use these definitions and I'll, and I'll open this up to, to everybody who wants to comment on it is, you know, we, we're talking a lot about coalition building and we're having this event leading up to the California Democratic Party's convention, right? And so the idea is, is that we know that some Jewish activists um, in this room, so to speak, um, have been nervous in the past um, to kind of work on building these coalitions or bringing up these issues just because of a fear of belonging or anti-Semitism or, 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 right? Um, and so my question kind of for all of you is, how do we continue to build these coalitions and how for some of us do we take those first steps when there's a little bit of fear and a tendency to um, tread lightly, so to speak, to try to to not offend or to try to maybe um, not get attacked or things like that. Um, you know, I would love to hear everyone's insights on how we think we can be doing better on these issues because we, we definitely need to, as Vlad has pointed out very poignantly. I, I think we stay at the table and in conversation, um, listening, uh, you know, and acknowledging that uh, privilege is not a static um, situation, right? Um, I, I, I also think, um, I think that, I think that often we have this thing where we're creating like, oh, if you, th if you think this way, you are pure this or a pure progressive or a pure, I, th I think that we understand with everyone's intersections and I, and I hope with more discourse and dialogue, we'll understand this deeply. Um, but with everyone's intersections, you are never one static thing at, at any time. The oppressed can easily become the oppressor. Um, and I, so, I think, and, and especially as it pertains to the Black and Jewish community, the only person, the only group that wins when we're squabbling at the margins is the oppressor. 
we cannot, so we have to stay in dialogue. We have to stay in conversation. I remember going to the Women's March um, and making my sign. I was like, I'm not gonna be uh, told that I don't belong here. I'm gonna occupy all of my space and all of my humanity here. Um, and I made my sign. Uh, Black Jewish woman, no racism, no anti-Semitism, and it, only because I couldn't carry a longer sign, I didn't say all the things, but like, dude, we are, everyone is a multitude of things, so we've got to recognize those intersections and, um, and stay in dialogue with one another. Yeah, I um I want to throw it back uh, to Eric Ward because he's just so brilliant. Um, he he's you know he already got all this figured out. Um, he said this uh, thing in, in you know in terms of addressing. I think he was asked to address you know, um, I think it was about uh, anti-Semitism that had uh, cropped up in the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Um, and you know he was asked you know how do we stay in, in in coalition? How do we fight for the things that we really care about? Um, how do we advance our values when in those spaces? Um, we are met with anti-Semitism. And he said, look, you cannot fight racism and expect not to experience racism. You cannot fight anti-Semitism and expect not to experience anti-Semitism. It's there, right? It's there because it's part of our broader society. Um, and so, you know, we have to, as you said, Kiyomi, uh, we have to stay in coalition, right? We have to uh, sort of lean into our values. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I will say that I think everybody has to have their red lines, right? Um, you know, when an organization becomes systemically racist, not when there's, you know, individuals involved with an organization here and there, or, you know, somebody says a thing or whatever, um, but when an institution becomes systemically racist, systemically anti-Semitic, um, you know, it's understandable that people will want to peace out. Nobody mm -hmm. can be forced to, to stay in and have their dignity assaulted day after day after day. So we all have to decide for ourselves what are our red lines, but I would just urge everybody to, to stay in the fight, right? To stay in coalition because these things matter. Um, and, you know, if we don't, who will, right? Like we have one world, we have one society, we have one nation. Um, we have to live together. We have to figure out how to, um, how to advance towards uh, the kind of society where we can all thrive, right? And the only way we do that is you know, in solidarity with one another. Absolutely. I completely agree. I'll just add one quick thing and then I, I'm gonna say uh, good night to everyone on the call. Um, I'm often asked if I'm Jewish, like all the time because I'm working on anti-Semitism issues. Just because I, I work on, my title is to combat anti-Semitism. Oh, I'm oh. asked if I'm Jewish all the time yes. too, but for another reason. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's it's it actually shows the crux of the issue that that Jews are expected to be the ones that are fighting this this problem, which I think um, Vladi said it so well. Like it's a malady of the non-Jewish body. It's and, and and I'm not Jewish, and I'm assumed that I am because I'm taking on this fight. And I think some of the biggest successes we've had, and I'm looking even back to my career in the U.S. government when we had um, Muslim leaders actually talk to um, governments of, of of Muslim countries and say, actually, those textbooks. That has anti-Semitism in them. Your school, like on your website, that's anti-Semitism. Those leaders actually turned the, the, their, their heads and listened when it was something, this is not, it's not part of Islam. It's not part of our beliefs, change this. That went so much further than our special envoy to modern human anti-Semitism who was Jewish saying those same things. And the same goes for the other space too, when, when Jews are speaking out against anti-Muslim sentiment and, and you know, and, and it just, and, and it, I've seen it. And I, and, I'm, and I think that's such a powerful message that we need to be sharing right now is empowering those who aren't us, like in our in our group, um, to speak out for us and to give them the words to do it, and and that's something that I think um, you know it's it, it's it's a hard time. We're facing a really challenge, but there's actually so much potential here, and I think this group right here is 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 showing that. Definitely, um, and I think just to to almost add on if my, my own little piece is that I think it's, it's very important for us to continue having conversations with those that maybe um, initially we would be afraid to reach out to or we wouldn't necessarily think to reach out to because we would make assumptions, right? And I think that as we are moving forward, um, especially in the CDP, but really in our communities in general, we have really come to a turning point in the United States in, in particular. And I think that these are conversations that we need to be having with each other, whether that's uncomfortable, whether that's someone just asking and saying, I, I don't know, um, would you mind just kind of elaborating on this? Just the ability to ask questions and talk and share perspectives, I think is so important to this work. And I think it's often um, left out on the sides a little bit. So 
with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I am so, so grateful for really this, again, this coalition of the Jewish community that we've been able to have tonight um, for our speakers who, I mean, insight that I don't have, and I think I'm too absorbed in these issues half the time. So, so really, Vlad, I know Holly just jumped off, and uh, Rabbi Rochelle, I cannot thank you enough for, for being here, truly. Um, and if I have a call to action for anybody, it's that I hope that this night was informative for all of you. And if it kept stirring conversation, we have questions we couldn't even get to, but if it stirred questions in conversation, or if it raised more questions than it did answers, please feel free to reach out to anybody here on this webinar. We are all activists. We are all here trying to change our community for the better, and we can't do that without each other's support. So um, let's start building those coalitions. Let's start working together. Um, and just as a general note, the recording, all the resources that everybody, our panelists shared tonight will be sent out along with the feedback form. Um, so if you wouldn't mind filling that out so we can know what you liked, how we can improve, um, that would be wonderful in informing our work moving forward. And so thank you everyone. The sun is rising uh, here, here in Israel. So I'm gonna wish you all a good night um, and thank you for joining us truly.